Welcome to Partners Innovation, where we connect with our many partners both within and outside our community. Today, I am so excited to introduce my guest and my friend. Um, a lot of you will know her as a partner in our community, especially from UWM, and our guest today is Anne Bastings. Hi, Anne. Hi, Trish. It's oh, great to see you. It's so great to see you. Yeah. We always, you know, sometimes we meet on the streets in Shorewood, you know, wherever we are or whatever, but our paths always connect, and we have a lot of connections together. So I was just really excited to have you in person. Um, you know, like I look at you and I think, oh, American gerontologist, a scholar, <laughs> an artist, an educator, <laughs> an author, and a recipient of the MacArthur Fellowship Award. The list goes on and on, and I've known many of your other accomplishments besides being a wonderful mother and um, just friend to all. Tell us about your journey and how you got here. To this very moment? <laughs> well, just your journey so far. You know, I think the journey starts with a kid who found the arts to be a friend, you know, in a, in a growing up time that you know, was hard, just, it was a way for me to be creative and, and have an outlet. And um, I really treasured that. And I also treasured friendships with my grandmother who drove my mom a little crazy because she and my, her mother were a little oil and water, but I, <laughs> I just loved her. She was you know, a little kooky and yeah. wonderful and had a really colorful past as a kind of a cowgirl in Montana and wow. like just lots of stories and so I was I had friendships with older people um, so I found both the arts and older people were part of my life um, and then there came this point where I realized that wasn't normal for everybody <laughs> I, in my academic career I kind of wanted to find out why um, why isn't that normal for everyone? Um, why aren't these two things mixed together more in our lives? That's sort of, sort of is a, a, in a hindsight 2020 way, charts the path forward of how I came to really see the value of creativity as a way for people to be in connection and to bridge people across the generations. High Point has an unbelievable partnership that we, I think, has been maybe 10 years, at maybe least even over 10 yeah. years that we've been working together. Can you talk about our partnership? You know, I, I mean, it started, I um, was at UWM for a couple of years on fellowships, kind of when time slips and the work I was doing with improvisation and creativity, I was just starting. And then um, one of those fellowships sent me off to New York and I found myself in a position where I either was going to go back to my teaching job at UW Oshkosh or stay in New York with my new husband in my new apartment. <laughs> and wow. So I left academia entirely um, and then kept growing the work I was doing out there, then recruited by um, a, to be the new founding director of the Center on Aging Community and came back to Milwaukee in 2003 um, with new baby and new husband in tow. And um, that was really the beginning of a lot of partnerships that I formed. So I know that we probably partnered in some way during the 10 years when I was with them. And I brought in artists in residence, um, David Greenberger mm -hmm. and Laura Jackman and um, Wing Young Huey. And really, and then I hit a point where I was like, you know what, I'm the next artist in residence. <laughs> so I wanted to do um, my own work in that way. Um, then the Center on Aging Community got reorganized um, and I went back to the Peck School and I thought I can't leave these relationships. Let's build the creative trust. And who's the, one of the first people I call because I know how excited she's going to be about the creative trust is you. Mm -hmm. And of course I was right. Um, you were very excited about the creative trust. And we sat down around the table with communities, aging communities and aging um, service programs um, and said, how can we together create something that 
brings intergenerational arts programming to life in Milwaukee consistently and sustainably. And um, that's what we did. We set out, um, I think that was 2013. Yeah. And um, eventually sort of, it was a lot of trial and error. Mm -hmm. We figured out student artists in residence was the way to go. Um, it was a deep community building, relationship forming, year long opportunity. We started as a semester, if you remember, and that didn't work um, as well. It worked just not as well as a year. Much deeper relationships built. Um, and then we started running with the Student Artist in Residence program, which now sort of runs like clockwork, which is just amazing. It's, it is amazing. And, and as you look back and, you know, trial and error of whatever, because I know the first student I came didn't live in, you know, it was a year long program. Then we started with the semester. We figured that was not probably the best. And then it was always an so-called artist and now it's open to so many different things that you know the students are doing yeah and so with each student brings a whole nother opportunity yeah and well you know I've really moved to a place where this work is about cre engaging people's right. creativity right. and you're t we're tapping into people's innate creative capacity and you can be uh, a health sciences student who can tap their in, their creative capacity to form relationships and build community. You don't have to necessarily be um, an art student, um, although that that helps. Mm -hmm. um, but we can we can help those students um, into those experiences to to learn to build community through creative engagement, um, and it also helps that. Um, you know, I would love eventually for this to be open to any student across the whole campus yeah. and to grow this. Yes. Um, I mean, my dream is like, you know, a fleet of 20, 25 students um, collaborating um, across aging services programs intergenerationally. I mean, you can imagine the possibilities oh, with it. Absolutely. It's, it's, it's so exciting to see how much it's grown yeah. and to be a part of it. It is amazing. And, you know, the students that live on site with us, it, it is so interesting to hear their experiences as well as the residents' experiences. And it's such a great way to bridge the generations. It just, it's just a beautiful, beautiful thing. I want to know, you have spent over 20 years researching ways to infuse the arts into care centers with a, a particular focus on cognitive disabilities, we know de dementia, Alzheimer's. How did you get there and why is it so important to you? I got there by um, way, way back. Um, I was doing, you know, I'm a creative artist as well as a scholar. So mm -hmm. I, I was really fascinated to look at um, senior theater programs mm -hmm. and how they were essentially doing this thing which was the opposite of what everyone understood aging to be. So even like dominant theories at the mm -hmm. time was this aging is increasing distillation of who you are. Mm -hmm. Like a like in cooking the the reduction metaphor, like yeah. you just become more and more who you are. Um, it's the opposite of growth. Mm -hmm. It's actually a distillation, right? Mm -hmm. Well, I was seeing eighty seven year olds playing Juliet for the first time. I was seeing <laughs> an expansion of roles through performance. Mm -hmm. And I was like, these two things do not compute. How does, how, how, what can we learn from mm -hmm. performance to change the way we understand aging for ourselves and for the society? Um, so that was my dissertation in my first book. And then I thought, hmm, those performances all are, are really cleansed of disability could this same power be used with people with really profound disabilities like Alzheimer's? Mm -hmm. So then I was just doing um, volunteering, just walked into a nursing home, family uh, relative worked there and got me a volunteer gig. And I was just experimenting with what worked. And it was improvisation, imagination-based improvisation 
where people really felt it was almost like creating a little lab space mm -hmm. for experimentation with communication. Because, you know, in dementia, you get used to shutting down your communication because you're going to say the wrong thing or people are going to hear it wrong or you're hearing it wrong. And it's just easier just to not say anything. So you just shut down and then the internalization makes it worse. It's a disease of isolation. Mm -hmm. And inviting someone into expression where there's no right or wrong answer invites them back out into meaningful connection with, for themselves to understand themselves and then with other people. So it is sort of a language um, that you can learn to facilitate with people with dementia. It also happens to be a language you can facilitate with people without dementia. So it also serves to connect them to the larger care community. Independent living, assisted living, skilled care, you can use these as individual communication techniques, but also as community building projects and events. Which is so cool. And I think that, the, you know how we talk about lifelong learning yep. and that we can never stop and life has to be so purposeful. And that's, that's where you're at, the dignity, the instilling that enthusiasm and also your inner child, you know, constantly playing, being, playing. Yeah. You know, I've done so many things with you that I'd say to myself, I don't know what the heck we're doing here, but <laughs> <laughs> I go, but it's my friend Anne and you know what? It's going to be fun wherever we go. Yeah. And it is because it's like trusting and then going with it and through some of the performances, some of the crazy stuff that we've we've been partners <laughs> to, you know, one of the things that you did that I just loved was the Penelope project. Yeah. That that one was so interesting. Can you just I know it's hard to say it in a nutshell. In a nutshell? Yeah, it's hard to say it you in know, a nutshell. Okay, imagine you know there's individual programming sessions um, in care settings, right? Yes. So you have a calendar of events. Yes. Imagine a calendar of events for a year where everything on it was, not everything, but a, a consistent thing on it was the development of a long range reinterpretation of the story of Homer's Odyssey. And we didn't know what it was gonna build into. We knew maybe a play, mm -hmm. but it, it's an iterative thing where we discover it together. So we're making, we're co-creating, co-discovering, co-learning in a rigorous thing. So we had like a classic scholar that collaborated with us and taught us ancient Greek and taught us the themes of hospitality and the, the cultural context of ancient Greece. And then through all that discovery in collaboration with residents and staff and we brought in a theater company and students. We all just worked on this together. And we thought it's a community building thing. So everyone from the skilled care to adult day um, to family members who wanted to come in and participate with loved ones, which should not be revolutionary. No. <laughs> No. Right? It, Absolutely. That should not be. Absolutely. You know, the subtitle of my book is A Revolutionary Approach to, El to Dementia and Elder Care. And I, I, I should subtitle it, This Should Not Be Revolutionary. <laughs> truly. It, it it's truly embarrassing. Is. It, it truly <laughs> is. Because we, we've seen it change. Yeah. And the Penelope Project was so cool because, you know, I remember you doing parades throughout, yep. the, throughout the nursing home. Yeah. And just things that, that really that you look at today, it should be done all the time. All the time. You know, and, and there shouldn't be stigmas and there shouldn't be, and that's, that's what you've been doing in your work. Well, and you'd be really happy to know that um, the next step from there was taking another epic story, so Peter Pan, mm. and this time mm. we worked with 12 nursing homes who all collaborated on the same project. So instead of one continuing care retirement community, we worked with 12 wow. um, who were all in rural settings in Kentucky, which had its own challenge of you know, finding artists yeah. and teaming up artists. Again, it was astonishing. We, we created over a year and a half, same thing, took it apart into workshops, put it into an immersive play that was staged inside the nursing homes 
and invited the larger community to experience it. And it was just a total joy. Then just as we were about to share it, yeah. COVID hit. Oh. And so any kind of press or news about a play that involved um, bringing hundreds of people into a nursing home seemed somehow not appropriate anymore. <laughs> so, so we kind of hit this news gap. So I'm trying to find ways to tell that story because it's just oh, it was you'll astonishing. be able to tell it. You'll be able to tell it as as the world is opening more. Yep. I mean, I think that's really great. Tell us about your new book. <laughs> tell, I mean, it's well. Look at it. Yeah. Um, so Creative Care was the name of the book that came out exactly a year ago today, mm -hmm. which is kind of thrilling. Mazel tov. Yes. Mm -hmm. And it's now out in paperback. Okay. And then um, we got a grant from the Ralph Wilson Foundation in Detroit to do a, a kit that, was, um, that would accompany it. And it's so we, we designed it in collaboration with family caregiving support networks um, in the Detroit area. And that's going to make a sound because there's Velcro. <laughs> Ooh, Velcro. Um, I wanted, we wanted to design something beautiful that families could feel honored, you know, by the design and the effort that went into it and feel that rigor and value it, when they used it. <clears throat> and something fun that they could play together in a positive way. So there's 15 quest beautiful question cards and 15 image prompts. And on the back of the beautiful question cards are thoughtful actions so that you can kind of develop them a little bit more, your responses. And then there's a little, oh, there's like little stickers too to keep them in place. A journal with instructions. This is my favorite part. It's really pretty on the inside design. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Who designed the inside? Um, we had originally um, Lafayette American, which is a uh -huh. Detroit-based um, design firm, helped us. And then HarperCollins took their design and kind of adapted it into something that could be more mass-produced. The original one that, that Lafayette American and Midwest Common did was really stunning, but it would have been $100 yeah. per per kit and we wanted it to be a little more accessible. So this so. reminds me too of when you took out the cards. So it's 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 a concept of your time slips. It is. Yeah. It's Which a, I know you were yeah. doing here too. Yep. Yeah. yeah. And, and we'll get back to that now that COVID's gone uh, move, moving evolving yeah. I should say. I can't say Well it's and gone. I love time slips because you can do it with anybody. It doesn't matter yep. who it is. Or even their age, really. Yeah. yeah. It's just great conversation starters and yep. huge, huge ways to to really get people really involved. Yep. Yeah. I see it. You know, the time slips method has evolved in, and now I sort of see it as it's an invitation to imagine together mm -hmm. and to to shape that imagination into something. Mm -hmm. So whatever prompt you use, I mean, we could look out the window and do mm -hmm. a time slip story. Um, we could do it all in movement. We could mix sound. We could do visual art. You can really do anything. It's really about that improvisational framework um, of inviting someone and really intensely echoing their contributions so they feel heard and recognized. Wow. And with your book, how do people get a hold of it? It's everywhere. <laughs> it's you can. It's just creative care. Okay. I would say if you're here, go up to Boswell's um, okay. and grab a copy. Um, but you can order it off off um, bookshop online if you're uh -huh. supporting independent bookstores or or Amazon and just get it delivered. It's yeah, paperback. And then of all COVID experiences, I transformed my, our cedar closet into a recording studio and read the audio book myself. So if you want to hear me talking to you for a couple hours, you can get oh, the I audio think book. Oh, fabulous. Yeah, it was very funny. And usually I always ask my guests, like, you know, one fun fact or what do you do? You know, the fact that you have turned your art and your creativity into a passion and into your life and how you experience life every day and in your work life. Tell me something that I don't know about you. I always have loved 
uh, singer-songwriter music, mm -hmm. and so I, I played guitar since I was little, and then I think as a way to introduce my kids to it, expanded to ukulele, and then um, my big gift to myself with the MacArthur um, was I went out and bought myself a really beautiful banjo because I always oh. dreamed of playing oh, it. Oh, that's beautiful. And took some lessons, sort of, you know, not great at it, getting there. It just takes a lot of practice, so I'm trying to find time to do that. And um, But now, happily, my, my younger son is just a beautiful guitar player, um, and that's a real treat to me. So It's wonderful. Wonderful. It has been such a pleasure having you here. I just want to keep you here all day. <laughs> I just want to play with you all day. And we'll just play. We'll I play. really do because that is that is the best part of living. It really is. Well, I really look forward to future collaborations, more student artists in residence, and just bigger dreams. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you again. Thank you for watching today's episode. If you liked what you saw, please make sure to su subscribe to our channel and click the notification bell. You can also find us on Facebook and LinkedIn. Goodbye and have a great day.